Hey everyone, it's Matt. Um, we had some issues with recording our next main episode, and so while we get that sorted out, we are going to be re-releasing a previous episode this time around. We thought it would be appropriate to re-release one of the episodes that Grady Hendrix joined us for in honor of the release of his latest book last week, How to Sell a Haunted House. So we are revisiting the episode that Grady joined us for when he was releasing his previous book, The Final Girl Support Group. It was the last in a series that we did on Final Girls from May of 2021. We apologize for the inconvenience, but we will be back in two weeks with a brand new episode. And until then, enjoy this episode with Grady Hendrix. This is the No Fear Podcast. We know what scares you. I'm Matt. I'm Mel. And I'm Lisa. And this is the No Fear Cast, the podcast where we dissect horror and all the things that scare us. This is episode 18 of season 5, and today we are joined by a very special guest, horror writer Grady Hendrix. So I don't know necessarily that Grady Hendrix needs a long introduction because he's been on this podcast twice before. We really enjoy having him, but we did want to tell you all listeners about his book that's coming out. So Grady Hendrix's upcoming book is the final girls support group. It'll be out on July 13th, 2021. Um, I'm sure you could probably pre-order it now <laughs> for those of you who really enjoyed his, his last book. I'm sure you've been looking forward to this. So the final girl support group has this description. In horror movies, the final girl is the one who's left standing when the credits roll. The one who fought back, defeated the killer, and avenged her friends. The one who emerges bloodied but victorious. But after the sirens fade and the audience moves on, what happens to her? Lynette Tarkington is a real-life final girl who survived a massacre 22 years ago, and it has defined every day of her life since. And she's not alone. For more than a decade, she's been meeting with five other actual final girls and their therapists and a support group for those who survived the unthinkable, putting their lives back together piece by piece. That is until one of the women misses a meeting and Lynette's worst fears are realized. Someone knows about the group and is determined to take their lives apart again piece by piece. But the, uh, but the thing about these final girls is that they have each other now. And no matter how bad the odds, how dark the night, how sharp the knife, they will never ever give up. So listeners, please enjoy this talk as we dive deeper into the final girl phenomenon and talk with Grady about his upcoming book. Okay, well, we're here with Grady Hendrix. Thank you, Grady, for joining us today. What? I'm always happy to. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Yeah, no problem. Okay, well, when I heard that you had written a book called The Final Girls Support Group, I got so excited. Um, I know you do a whole lot of research going into your books and it always sounds like a lot of fun. So I, I can only imagine the research that went into this. So do you want to, I don't know, talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah. Well, you know, the book is about these final girls and I've always sort of wondered like what happens to them next? Like, how do you, how do you live the rest of your life after this horrible thing happened, the worst night of your life when you're like 17? Because the thing with the final girl is not only do they have to survive, they have to kill someone. Like, they have to kill the killer, which I think is, like, super traumatic. And so this is about a support group for them years later, and someone's killing them one by one. And, and you know, it's funny. Before I write a book, usually a lot of my research is, like, period research, a lot of research on support groups and things like that. But um, most of the research I did on slashers was after the book was done because I wanted to um, put a show together that I'm going to be doing, even though it's going to be virtual, I'll be doing a show like I sometimes do to promote the book. And so now I'm in the middle of that and I'm reading all these like serial killer and slasher books and uh, watching all the movies again and watching the ones I haven't watched and, you know, putting together a, a unified field theory of slashers, which is fun. Um, but, you know, the, the weird thing is, 
everyone's pretty familiar with the movies. Uh, the books are a little weirder, and like the books sort of get a little more omnivorous. Like I'm including serial killer books and sort of sort of murder books is what they're under because uh, there's stuff like Black Christmas, which is has no relation to the Black Christmas movie. But it's like a Jallo, like a full-on Jallo set in upstate New York on like Christmas Eve and the small town sheriff. He's got to figure out who's killing people one by one. And he's super stressed out because he has, like, he's just, he's getting divorced. And he hasn't even bought his daughter a Christmas present yet. And everyone's turning up dead. And the killer is, wears like black leather gloves and kills people with a straight razor. And you never see their identity. And they're all these red, I mean, it's super duper Jallo. And, so, and then there's stuff like, steroid blues by richard laplante which is like an early 90s book about a dude who's a super jacked bodybuilder with this like beard and he's covered in body hair and they constantly talk about how his penis is like a descend uh, um uh, what do they call it uh, a dangling brown worm and um they uh and he's always like getting pumped up and like taking meth and taking steroids and then he goes out and he's murdering people and he's murdering all these neo-nazi bodybuilders who are also steroid dealers and meth hat dealers because they killed his sister and the 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 main one is this austrian dude who wears like a unitard that has fake testicles built into it with like silicon that looks like he has giant balls and um and and so he's trying to get to that guy and kill him. And that guy, like, drinks fresh monkey brains. He gets them, like, shipped in. And um, then you discover at the end, twist, the jacked-up bodybuilder who's killing people to avenge his sister is actually the sister. And she's taken steroids for so long that she's turned into a man. And at the end of the book, fortunately— the sympathetic karate dealing coroner who's like the cop on the case, his gifted and talented wife is an amazing plastic surgeon. And so she's able to put her body back together. So like, I mean, so that's not quite a slasher, but it's a murder book, you know? So I'm just sort of, it's hard to pass things up when you see a little jewel like that. <laughs> I'm glad I was on mute while you were discussing that because. I feel like everyone hung up. <laughs> I was trying not to laugh into my microphone too much. Okay, well, this is something that we've kind of talked about a little bit because the final girl seems to be connected like to the slasher genre, but yeah. it's hard to like define what the slasher genre is because I've heard people who get like really, you know, nitpicky about like, no, that doesn't fit or this doesn't fit. Um, but then I like the way he kind of just described it as murder books. Right. Um, because that's kind of what the final girl has to live in. Like she has to live in the murder world and then that yeah. way she can come through the murder world. So I don't know in, in doing all this research, like, did you change your definition of slasher at all or does it matter? Well, yeah, I don't. Okay. So a, it doesn't matter. B though, I, I find like going over and over issues of like taxonomy like this really fascinating and kind of educationally. Like, who cares if something's a horror novel or a thriller? Who cares if it's a slasher or a serial killer book? On the other hand, trying to figure out what, what makes it a slasher or a serial killer book, I think makes you start thinking about what these books are about and their commonality. So I think a slasher is a killer in a confined location, working their way methodically through the cast. And the last person left alive usually kills or otherwise disables the killer. And that, to me, is the slasher definition. I think Alien fits as a slasher. You know, I don't think a slasher, you have to have a concealed identity. Like, everyone knows who Jason is by the, the second or third movie. You know, everyone knows who Freddy Krueger is. They just don't believe he exists. Everyone knows who Michael Myers is. Um, he has the eyes of pure evil. So, like... You know, the concealed identity, I think, is more of a Jalo thing. But, like, by that definition, you know, Alien certainly fits in, which I think, and I think most people consider Sigourney Weaver a final girl, at least when you see her grouped in, you know. But, um, and I also think that, in general, a slasher isn't supernatural. I mean, yes, Jason's a zombie. Michael Myers has a, you know, he's a druid or whatever. Freddy Krueger, people can't really kill you in your dreams. But like, you know, it's not like a vampire. Like like Jeepers Creepers, I don't think of as like a slasher, you know? 
um, or Jeepers Creepers too. So because it's a supernatural monster, although then alien malaria is science fiction. So yeah, but so but it's murder, right? It's people killing people who are the luckiest people of all. So that's my definition of a slasher. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, I completely. Yeah, I don't know. It just it does bother me the way people feel like they have to really like pinpoint what something is or what something isn't. Um, anyway. It is, I mean, it is fun. It, it's it's well, what we like to talk about. <laughs> and it, yeah, and it makes you kind of think about, like, the commonalities between the films, right? Right. I mean, yeah, that that's what movie people do, right? Um, I've heard. I read an article <laughs> once. <about that. laughs> I just, I wanted to jump in just really quickly, because you were talking about how the genres blend into each other. Grady, while you were doing all this research, watching movies and reading books, did you see commonalities between the books and the movies? Like, did the books start following trends when the slasher film became more popular? Or do they oh, yeah. borrow from each other or no? No, I think they do. And I think, you know, and I, like, I, you know, I'll never read enough. Like, you know what I mean? Like, there's, a, there's always someone will be like, yes, you read 78 books, but you didn't read this one that changes everything, you know? And so, um, so I speak from a point of profound ignorance, but... You know, the big thing that happened, I think, with slashers is that they got more for kids, right, as time went by. Like, Black Christmas is a nasty movie. Texas Chainsaw Massacre is a nasty movie. Those, I mean, teenagers watch them, but they are not for kids. Halloween, more for kids, but nasty. Friday the 13th, getting more for kids. And then, you know, as the 80s went on, slashers got more and more aimed at a, a kid audience, right? Like, you know, the Nightmare on Elm Street movies. I mean, I think those are 100% aimed at teenagers. Um, the later Halloweens, the later um, Friday the 13th. And so you see that too with the books. Like early on, there's a lot of murder books, like a super duper, a lot of like the murder books are influenced by like Silence of the Lambs and Red Dragon and stuff like that. And then as you go along, you start getting into much more fun books that are more YA. Like Christopher Pike has written a bunch of books that I think would be called slashers. People say R.L. Stein writes books that are like slashers, but I refuse to accept what R.L. Stein writes or books. So I don't know about that. You see stuff like uh, Joe Gibson, who wrote my favorite slasher book of all, Sleigh Ride. No, Sleigh Bells. Sorry, Jesus, I did my favorite. I don't even know the name. Um, Sleigh Bells, which is great. Like, it is literally the closest thing you can get to, like, an 80s slasher in book form. So, yeah, so as as time goes by, they get more and more aimed for kids, and the books go, the books sort of split into two tracks, right? Post-Silence of the Lambs, you've got the super gory, super gross serial killer books, like Rex Miller's Slob and stuff like that. And then on the other side, you've got the more YA stuff from Christopher Pike and Joe Gibson and authors like that. There was even a Halloween series of YA books uh, starring Michael Myers. Um, but And so you have that track. I, you know, I had honestly never really thought about it as, like as an age, like from an audience point of view. I had mm -hmm. never thought of slashers that way. The thing that always stuck like stuck out to me about slashers or like these kind of murder horror films is that most people I think who came into horror came into horror through that door. Yeah. Like, and well, that makes so complete sense now. Yeah. Yeah. Well, exactly. There's so many of them and you know, they're group movies, right? Like, who wants to hang out with their friends and watch Silence of the Lambs? Like, who wants to hang out with your friends and watch Seven? Like, those are heavy movies, you know? But, like, watching Friday the 13th Part 4, sure, why not? That's fun. That's a movie you can, like, half pay attention to a little bit, you know? No, absolutely. And and the Christopher Pike, too. Like, you, you mentioned Christopher Pike, but I don't, I don't think that can be, like, overstated, <laughs> at least for yeah. me how important Christopher Pike was in my introduction to horror, because a lot of people talk about Stephen King when they talk about reading horror, which of course, because he's written everything, <laughs> um, he, he hasn't stopped. But like, for me, it was Christopher Pike and all of, all of his, like, you know, remember me and slumber party and even, oh, yeah. even the one uh, the midnight club, which I just reread recently, which isn't a murder book, but it's, it reads like one in a weird way because like death is almost like stalking this group of kids. 
Um, yeah. even though it's in the form of like illnesses, but yeah, I don't know. Did you read um, R.L. Stein much or just mostly Christopher Pike? You know, I read a few R.L. Stein. I could not tell you what I read. I read <laughs> some of his Fear Street books. Those were the yeah. first first ones I picked up because I grew up in like a really conservative household where like things were uh, monitored as far as what I watched. Mm -hmm. But for some reason I could read whatever I wanted. <laughs> yeah. So, no, same, same here. Yeah. I went Harvard, crazy yeah. when I got to the Walden books because they had that whole like YA section and I started with Fear Street and then very quickly moved on to Christopher Pike, but I could not tell you which Fear Street books I read. So. Yeah, no, it's the same here. I mean, I wasn't allowed to read R watch R-rated movies, but as long as it was had pages that turned, it was considered okay. But that led to this weird thing where I would convince my scoutmaster when we went to the gas station for snacks after, I think it was my Cub Scout Master, maybe, for snacks after meetings, that my parents said it was okay for me to buy magazines with my snack money. And so I'd buy Fangoria and then like sneak it home. And then I would read it and then pretend I'd seen the movies, you know, because like they pretty much gave you the whole plot. So like, you know, I, I, that's how I quote unquote saw like most of the horror movies before I was like 15. Oh, same, same. Fangoria and Blockbuster was useful for that because, you know, they showed a lot on the VHS covers. Oh, you, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I snuck a lot of plots that way. Like, I, I, I told a lot of people I had seen Hellraiser when I had absolutely not. <laughs> yeah. For me, it was Alien because I read the comic book adaptation of Alien years before I saw it. And so I was like, oh, yeah, this movie's great. And, like, I was the first one to, quote, unquote, see it uh, in my carpool. <laughs> I love it. All right. Well, I guess, like, if the 80s and 90s, or since we're kind of talking about that era and the slashers and the final girls, I'm wondering, who do you think is the most influential final girl of that time period? I mean, the most influential has got to be Laurie Strode, you know? like. Yeah. I think she really set the template for a lot. Like, like Adrian King is great, but Adrian King's in one movie. You know what I mean? And, and a little bit of the second one, like from from Friday, like Laurie Strode. She's in, and and I feel like one thing that's really important with Final Girls and these things and slashers is there's more than one. You know what I mean? Like, I mean, not always, but like like the Prowler. There's only one. Thank God. But like. When you, with like, Final Girls, the sequel seems to be really important, which I always thought was kind of, like, cruel. Like, you survive all this stuff, all this terrible things happen to you, you watch all your friends die, you have to murder someone. And then it happens again, and, like, sometimes you get, like, bumped off at the beginning of it, like, at the beginning of Friday 2, when Adrian King gets killed in the beginning, you're like, that is horrible. Like, and, and you know, Halloween H2O... I think it's like such a great ending for their fr that franchise. Like it's so good, and Jamie Lee Curtis is so on board. And then they're like, and they promised her they wouldn't make another one. And they're, you know, Mustafa Akkad's like, oh, we made a lot of money. Screw you, we're making another one. And so, you know, everything that happens at the end of H two O, which I think is a great moment between Laurie Strode and Michael Myers. Oops, it wasn't really Michael Myers. You actually, like, just tortured to death this poor paramedic, you asshole. Like, it's just so cruel and mean. And I feel like, okay, and this is where I'm going to get super pretentious, but, like, the franchises laid the groundwork for where we are now with movies. Like, there's not a lot of difference between a Nightmare on Elm Street movie and a Marvel movie. Like, it's recurring characters. They've got superpowers. They're quips. Everything's serious, but not too serious. It's, and you know, you've got the, like, superpowered dude who keeps appearing. Like, like that kind of repeated franchise, that really paved the way for sort of this franchise world we live in now. I mean, the, and the slashers got huge, you know, in the 80s when everyone realized that the, the blockbuster sequels made a lot of money, you know? And and there's even been people who are so cold-hearted, I don't think I'm one of them, who suggest that sort of the rise of serial killers, which isn't really 
a rise in serial killers. It's just a rise since the late 70s of using that term and labeling people committing crimes like that, serial killers, and, and investigating them as serial crimes and a special kind of crime. That that really fits in with sort of the serial nature of entertainment, and that's one reason that people are sort of obsessed with serial killers uh, in a pop culture kind of way, because they keep doing it. It's a character who does it over and over again. You get to know them, you know? And it's like, I mean, it's a little cold-hearted, but I kind of can see if you squint and look at it sideways, they got a point. I think it's an interesting, like when you say the repetition of it can be cruel toward the final girl character, that there's a cruelty there. I don't, Yeah. I found myself wondering if there's almost a gendered aspect to that, like just running this, because we call them final girls, you know, like gone girl or girl on the train, you know, that kind of preponderance yeah. of the use of the term girl. Do you think that, I, I totally understand what you're saying about making more money with the sequels and the idea of the serial killer makes total sense. But I wonder if there's something about like, I don't know, this is probably too strong of a word, but like torturing the final girl character that she's, she's not going to make it at some point or the audience is waiting for her to not make it, if that makes sense. Um, do you well, feel like yeah, that might be part of that character idea? Well, there is, I don't know, you know, there is an aspect where it's like, she survived one of them, let's put her in another one, and another one, and another one, until eventually the actress moves on, like, now she's dead. Like, you know, like, how much can you take? There is that, you know? I mean, there have been final girl, final boys before, far fewer. I mean, I'm thinking, what's his name, Mark Gaddis from Nightmare on Elm Street 2. But, yeah, I mean, I don't think, though there's a delight in torturing the final girl. You know, one thing I, I, I don't really super agree with, with Carol Clover, um, and I hate to blaspheme on a podcast, but she talks a lot about the killer's point of view and putting yourself in the killer's point of view. And, and I get it. And I think she's making a good point. But also, that comes out of the books. Like, Putting someone in the shoes of the killer is a literary device that goes all the way back to, to fiction in the 20s and the 30s. And, you know, someone like David Wardwell writes really cleverly about how that got picked up and turned into a narrative device in movies in the 40s. And you see that again, and it gets sharpened and honed into, like, you see books where they sort of like, like Psycho, where every other chapter, I think, is from Norman Bates' point of view. Or books like Dorothy Hughes in a Lonely Place or Jim Thompson's The Killer Inside Me, where the whole book is narrated from the killer's point of view, the serial killer's point of view. And then you start getting into movies that sort of like, you know, they show things from the killer's point of view. And I think there I think that's a holdover, you know, a little bit from that literary device, sort of sort of getting Xeroxed and Xeroxed and Xeroxed until it's blurry and doesn't look like the original anymore. But Back to your point. Sorry, that was a really long-winded digression. I don't think the intention is to torture the serial girl. I really don't. I think it's, I mean, maybe it is. I don't know. But what you see on screen is someone who gets everything thrown at them. And by all rights, should give up. And you see many other characters give up. And she doesn't. And she keeps going. And she can't be stopped. And to me... That's like, you know, that is a little more triumphant than sort of it's a gender torturing of her. Now, whether that reads as sexist or misogynist or not, I don't know, but I don't read it that way, but I can see how you could. Yeah, I mean, I, I always look at the final girl as being, you know, the, the reason she's recurring is because she is so triumphant. Right. And she, she she's the survivor because one of the problems I think and I mean, I don't know if it's a problem, but one of the things I see happening with especially the slasher films that get, you know, made over and over and over again, where you are just kind of seeing the same formula because it sells and it makes money, is at some point people start rooting for the killer to, like, mow down the victims, <laughs> you know, because right, right. that that's what you're that's what you're there to see. And it loses some of the terror because in the earlier, when you're first seeing something that's new and you see it from the killer's point of view, it's terrifying. Like those scenes in Black Christmas in the first one, when the killer's outside the house, it is mm -hmm. absolutely scary. It, it is one of the scariest home invasions, <laughs> you know, those scenes where, because you're, you're seeing him trespass somewhere where he's not welcome, where he's not wanted, and you know only bad things are going to happen. 
So it intensifies that fear, seeing it from his point of view. But then I think, you know, by the time you're watching Friday the 13th part, whatever, you do just start to want to, you know, you're like, oh, okay, here are more people. They're about to get killed. Let's, let's see this happen. And you kind of cheer because it's that communal thing of watching with your friends, right? Yeah. Um, but the final girl always seems exempt from that because we, at that point, we can p- pick her out and be like, oh, she's the one who's going to survive. So I'm, I'm going to root for her and everybody else can just bite it. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I mean, think about it though. It's it's like a sporting event, right? It's like Rumble in the Jungle. You're you're watching Ali and Foreman. That's who you're there for. You want to see Michael Myers and Laurie Strode mix it up. You're you're there for the main event. Everyone else is a chump and you don't want to root for a chump who's going to go out. You want to root for the champs. The final girl and the killer. Is this is looking at it in this way part of your inspiration for the upcoming book? Because you know the idea of the final girl support group that you know what happens afterward after all that trauma. Yeah, and actually, can I jump back to something you were saying a minute ago, Mel? Because I actually think when you were talking oh, about sure. like you know, all this stuff getting thrown at the final girl, you know, the question is, well, who's throwing it at her, right? Because because these movies aren't documentaries, so it's like a director and a screenwriter and a producer, right? They're they're the ones throwing all this stuff at the the final girl and and making her life hell. And yet she survives. Mm -hmm. She wins. She becomes like the famous one. You know what I mean? Like, Mm -hmm. like the John Carpenter can do all he wants to Laurie Strode. Laurie Strode is more famous than John Carpenter, you know, like, like Jamie Lee Curtis, like, you know, Stephen Minor can do everything he wants to, um, you know, Adrian King and, and kill her off in Friday part two. Adrian King's doing conventions and and having a fine life. Thank you very much. So, I mean, if that's the case, it's almost even more triumphant. If you look at it as like a behind the scenes thing that these women are getting tormented in these movies and then like, yeah, okay. And and you can go cash your check and she's going to go off and be famous. No, I like that way of looking at it. She's an ultimate survivor and almost becomes like folkloric, (laughs) like a folkloric hero of some sort. I yeah. use my dog just started barking, but <laughs> no, no, no. And you, and you know, it's funny. Like even in Halloween nine eight, what's the one with the reality show? Is that eight? The one after H two O or no two after H two O? I can't remember. Whichever one it is, um, with Busta Rhymes when he uh, kung fu kicks Michael Myers out the house and like actually kills Michael Myers. If you've ever seen that with the crowd, everyone's cheering for Buster Rhymes. Like, it is kind of like, you know, people want to see, people root for Michael Myers when it's someone who doesn't have a chance of beating Michael Myers. But as soon as the shoe's on the other foot, they're all rooting for the, whoever's going to kick Michael Myers' butt. But anyways. so <laughs> I think, is that Halloween Resurrection? Yes, Halloween Resurrection. But what <laughs> yeah. number is that? Is that nine? I think Maybe. I like to call um, the Halloween movies by their number just to remind people of how ridiculous it is that there are this many of them. Yeah, uh, I, I could not tell you which one that was. Um, yeah, because H2O is eight, right? So then that it must be nine because it yeah, came out nine. after that one. Yeah, yeah. No. Uh, sigh. <laughs> <laughs> um, sorry, Mel, and you were saying something a second ago about the book, and I have to promote the book. I'm here, I, I, you know, before, just like all these people learn in these franchises, the ultimate unstoppable killer is market capitalism, right? Those movies are just going to, Michael Myers is going to keep coming back as long as he makes money. So we're all, we're all at the mercy of the forces of the market. So what were you saying? I just totally spaced. Oh, no, that's fine. I was just wondering if uh, this this question that you had mentioned, like the final girl keeps returning and she's kind of traumatized, but she has to come back and go through it again. Was that part of what inspired you to look at a final girl support group? Oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's so mean. Like, you know, like if someone like invades your house and 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 ties you up and tortures you and and kills your family. That's horrible. I mean, that is really horrible. Good luck coming back from that. You're going to spend the rest of your life dealing with that. Three years later, they do it again. You know, that's the fate of a final girl. It's like, good God. Like, 
like after something terrible happens to you, people are going to say, look, this is really bad, but you're safe now and it's going to be okay. And it's going to be one day at a time. Not if you're a final girl, you're not never safe. If you're a final girl, what if there's a third sequel, you know, like it's just, you're never safe. You can never let your guard down. And so I wanted to sort of write about like, what are the responses to that? You can, you can, you know, get high all the time and ignore it. You can be in denial about it. You can, you know, face it and 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 per- turn into like a jacked up survivalist paranoid nutbag. You can like totally like go the Oprah way and be like, I will take this trauma and make it into something good for uh, to help others. I mean, there are all these ways. And it was just sort of like the gift that kept on giving the harder I shook that slasher tree. I feel like that's something that doesn't get explored enough. I mean, obviously in, in the... Like in the franchised slashers, you know, it's just Laurie Strode just keeps coming. She's like, okay, he's back again. <laughs> like, yeah. Let's let's get him again. Uh, but I, the one thing I, when you talk about kind of like trauma and the final girl, I always think about uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre and oh, yeah. the end of that film. And the first time I saw it, like I was absolutely... I mean, I, my senses were kind of obliterated after I saw that movie because that was the first one I had seen that was like a real proper, you know, murder movie. And yeah. the the scene at the end, I mean, first, you know, Leatherface like doing his like ballet twirl with the chainsaw and you kind of, <laughs> you know, you have to process that. But then seeing her get away on the truck, but absolutely covered in mu- uh, blood and just thinking she's not okay. And that was like the first film that I saw where it, it kind of hits you exactly what that means. Because I think I had seen a good number of Halloween and like Friday the 13th before I saw Texas Chainsaw. So I yeah. feel like that's a really heavy subject to explore. Yeah, well, and, you know, everyone remembers their first time seeing Texas Chainsaw. That movie is a movie I hated for years. And then finally I realized I hated it because it was, it worked. You know, like, it's so, there's really nothing else like it. Um, and, uh, yeah, so, you know, I one of the things is I tried really hard not to talk about trauma in the book or to talk around it and and not to talk about this being like a serious examination of trauma because I feel like so many people cope with real trauma in their lives and I'm talking about made up people but I do feel like there's a sense a lot of people have I have I think that that you're constantly struggling with something, you know, and, and whatever it is, and it's gaining on you. And your life is this chase sometimes where you're just barely escaping with your life. And and it's just this struggle that's going to be with you forever. And I kind of wanted to write a book about like, you know, sort of where that goes, like, can that get anywhere good? Because really sort of two things prompted this book and one was realizing that i'd spent so much of my life watching horror movies and watching people get murdered for fun and i was like what the hell what's wrong with me um should i be put away from other people and then realizing so many people did it and like well what does this mean because i you know i do think that constant exposure to some things can 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 desensitize you to it i mean facebook's a case in point um but I also came to sort of realize that, oh, for me at least, and maybe not for everyone, I mean, everyone does it for different reasons, there is, when I watch these movies, I'm rooting for the survivor. I'm trying to figure out who's going to live. And for me, their escape is sort of my vicarious triumph. Like, And so for me, I was like, oh, there is more than just murder to these movies, although the murder's fun. You know, I, I always like to see the kills and all that stuff, but ultimately what really distinguishes a slasher or a horror movie I like versus one that I'm okay with is that ending. You know, where does that ending go? And it doesn't have to be a happy ending, but there has to be some kind of of triumph or something. You know, I mean, I don't want to spoil a movie that's almost 40 years old, but like one of my favorite movies of all time, not just horror movies, is Return of the Living Dead. That doesn't necessarily have a happy ending, but the people in it, fight and they struggle and they win those struggles and for me that's super important they may not all win them intact and they may you know have horrible things happen later but 
I don't like seeing people get treated like like someone pulling the wings off a fly. You know, I, I don't like them seeing them them tortured, even though I like the first hostile movie quite a bit. I don't like seeing them tortured gratuitously. I want there to be a point, you know. But so but the other thing that inspired this book is first off was the beginning of Friday the 13th part two and just how horrible that is for Alice. Uh, yeah, Alice Hardy. She survived one. And she's putting her life back together, and you're like, oh, you got to live in this depressing house, and your mom's yelling at you on the phone, and ugh, that bathrobe's so gunky, and like, but you know, good for you. You're like, you're really doing it day by day, and all of a sudden, ice pick in the head, and you're like, holy shit, that is really cold blooded, like for real. And then the other one that really blew my mind is seeing Nightmare on Elm Street three, where Heather Langenkamp from the first movie shows up as a group encounter therapist for the kids in the third movie. And I'm like, holy cow, like final girls helping final girls. That's amazing. Like, like that's a great career choice. So like maybe Marilyn Burns at the end of Texas Chainsaw went on to become like a, a trauma counselor. I didn't, I feel like that's what happened in one of the screen movies. Didn't, um, Oh, did Sydney become a therapist? I feel like she did. Maybe she did. I might be making that up. Maybe in like the third movie. Well, you know, definitely in, um, oh God, what was the movie? Um, he, not He Knows You're Alone. Yeah, He Knows You're Alone about the guy calling the babysitter. Wait, the one in the, the 70s? Yeah, the one in the 70s. Oh, um, it's was that the one? Knows- uh, Wait, 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 wait. Was that the one where he was calling from inside the house? Yes. Okay. No. What was the name of that? Um, it's not. He knows. He knows you're alone. I feel like is about um, a woman on like she marries some dude who's like psycho or something. Hold on. Wait. When a stranger a calls is the one I'm thinking. When a stranger of. calls. Yes. Yeah. So when a stranger calls, which is for 1990. Carol Kane plays the the girl who gets torn, the babysitter in that. Yeah. And when yeah. a stranger calls back, which is an amazing sequel, I think from the early nineties, Carol Kane plays a trauma counselor um, who's like brought specifically in to help out the girl it's happening to again. I mean, it's so great. Also, Charles Durning is in it, and it's like fat Charles Durning, and he's like they make <laughs> him as like physical threat to the killer, but they can never show him walking because I guess he gets super out of breath. It's really amazing. He just sort of teleports around. Um, but when a stranger calls back is really good. Oh, I, I, I have, I actually have not seen the, uh, sequel to that, but I love when a stranger calls. So now I'm going to yeah. have to go look this up because yeah. it's weird. Um, it's definitely weird, but it's worth it. Oh man. And it, it looks like, I mean, I just did a quick Google, but it was a 1990. Oh, made for television. Yeah. I've got to watch this. Oh yeah. It's, it's really, <laughs> it's, it's the, it's like the first movie. It's got this super tense opening half hour. And then it just, unlike the first movie, which gets, I think a little pedestrian after the opening, it's still good, but like, you know, it's a, it's a thriller. Yeah. This turns into this super weird early nineties psychodrama. Like all I'll say is this, the killer has a ventriloquist act with a dummy. Of course he does. <laughs> And it's an existential ventriloquist act. Okay. Uh, you sold me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that movie sells itself. Yeah. I am 110% going to find this. I've, I've been, this is, this is me getting just really annoying with films, but um, like with everything being so weird in the past like year and being stuck at home, one of the projects I've become like obsessed with is collecting more like physical media. Yeah. Because I guess it's like a weird comfort thing, but I, t- <laughs> I was telling somebody, I was like, I really want to find all of these, you know, like the really random, like made for TV movies, like horror movies and all that. But I want to get them specifically on VHS. Oh, sure. And- just like, just so I have them for that experience. Like, this is just, <laughs> I don't know. Um, well, I mean, what you're going to have to do is start haunting garage sales, the yard sales, right? Like, yeah. like it's so, cause that's even better if they come with like the ads still on the tape from mm-hmm. where someone taped it off TV. Oh, absolutely. I wish I still had half of mine. Um, my sister and I had one of those VHS tapes that was like specifically for taping on the TV. And, uh, we figured out that for a while, 
we could just tape whatever we wanted because again our parents weren't watching um <laughs> so we we did that for a while. I have no idea where those are they're probably in a landfill somewhere do you um, actually have a working VCR I don't no I'm gonna have to get one of those too <laughs> well, you um, know, like I, I said I, what I keep thinking someone is missing an opportunity because if there was a streaming platform that was all made for TV movies and like they showed original ads and like in the ad breaks, I would subscribe to that so hard. Oh, 100% I would. <laughs> Absolutely. And they would have to be, yeah, they would just have to be solely made for TV movies. Nothing yeah. that had a wide theatrical release. Never, ever, ever. Made for TV movies only. Or you could sometimes, if they did um, a, a mainstream feature film, as long as it had a television cut that was radically different from the theatrical <laughs> version, I would accept it. <laughs> that, that was the other thing I think, like, my children will never understand is, is if you saw a movie in the theater that you loved... And then you were waiting for it to come out on the television so you could tape it and have it like have your favorite movie and own it. And then you realize that your favorite parts were cut out. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, that always confused me because I'd be like, wait, is this the same movie? Does that part exist? Like I was I was very weirded out. My thing I did was I would tape record, like, like I, our VCR was really crappy. So I would like audio tape movies I really loved and listen to them over and over again, which sounds like something a caveman would do. I may have done that a few times. Um, oh my God. I listened yeah. to my tape of the road warrior so many times. I used to be able to do the complete opening 20 minutes of that movie including the sound effects like they weren't good sound effects but i knew exactly where they came um i wish i could still do that oh mine was peewee herman so oh. <laughs> i still consider peewee's uh movie my first horror movie because that was the first movie that like scared the piss out of me yeah large large large, large. yeah <laughs> yeah I think I think that's a moment, you know, for my generation, which is which is a, a couple before yours. The moment is the end of Darby O'Gill and the Lost Little People, which is the Leprechaun movie Disney made, starring Sean Connery, where all of a sudden, out of nowhere, a freaking banshee shows up at the very last bit and like drags this person's soul off to hell, and it's like. Whoa. And it is this crazy optical effect. And like parents would show it at birthday parties. I saw it at P Peter Mansfield's birthday party. And I, one of the kids there actually did pee their pants. We were five. <laughs> and this thing. And so I feel like Large Marge is very similar. Like, oh, it's a fun movie for kids. No, it's not. <laughs> Up until that point, it was amazing. <laughs> yeah. I was going to say, I think they're actually, I don't know if it's still around, but there used to be a YouTube channel where a guy had taped all of the Saturday morning cartoons from like the late eighties and into the nineties for like the four or five hour blocks and uploaded it to YouTube. Like he had taped it back in the day, commercials and all not quite the made for TV thing, but, uh, but in the same ballpark. Yeah. Same ballpark. Uh, I, I watched one of them and the nostalgia hit very, very hard. So. Oh, I can imagine. Yeah. Well, I did actually kind of have a question for you with, with your book, with the final girls myself, kind of thinking of I mean, we've been talking about final girls and Laurie Strode and Texas Chainsaw Massacre as these big influences just in general. Did you find yourself drawing from any other sources for your final girl characters? Were there like any other particular final girls that sort of you may oh, yeah. have realized you were writing <laughs> into yeah. your book? Well, yeah. And, and, you know, it's, um, they're sort of the iconic ones, you know, and I wanted to keep them a little off brand, but like, so yeah, there's a summer camp slasher, you know, there is a dream slasher, there is a Santa Claus slasher, there's a redneck inbred hillbilly cannibal slasher, there's a meta slasher, like Scream, there's a brother sister slasher thing. So I wanted to, to have sort of each of the iconic ones, but there is a wild card final girl in this and and she sort of pops up and then she drops into the middle of the book she's not in the beginning 
But I realize that like those Canadian tax shelter movies of which Black Christmas is one and Prom Night and uh, My Bloody Valentine, you got to pay a little homage to those. So there is a Canadian final girl who kind of pops up in the middle. And I sort of then did a really cruel thing to her because then I sort of dropped in that 90s direct-to-video slasher thing when it was like the ginger dead man and Jack Frost and uh, uh, Leprechaun, you know, where they would just have a terrible special effects slasher. So I sort of, it's, uh, and it's called Gnome Coming because it kills, it's a gnome that kills on Homecoming. <laughs> so yeah. So, but, but yeah, I wanted to keep them sort of the big iconic ones because I think even if you haven't seen the movies, Summer Camp Slasher, the, the Brother Sister Slasher, the Santa Claus Slasher, the Dream, everyone knows those tropes. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. So, got to ask we've talked about who you think is the most influential. Who's your favorite final girl? I'm curious on that. Oh, well, gosh, I'm going to say something really lame, but like, kind of all of them like i really like listen marilyn burns riding away driving away in that pickup truck is such an iconic image i mean one of my favorite things i can't remember who did it, it might have been Patton oswald who tweeted out the gif of that at the end of 20 on new year's eve 2020 going it's 2021 and i was like yes that is america right now we are all marilyn burns in the back of that truck you know but like you know I mean, Jamie Lee Curtis is so iconic. And, you know, um, but but I even, I, 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 Sydney Prescott's a big deal for me, you know. But I will say there's two final girls who never get the credit. I think they're due. Um, and one is Danielle Harris from Halloween 4 and 5, um, even though she's much more annoying in Halloween 5, I think does an amazing job. And also, Lisa Wilcox, who's in Nightmare on Elm Street 4 and 5, who gets the greatest gearing up scene, I think almost of anyone except Rocky Balboa in a movie, or maybe, maybe Ellen Ripley at the end of Aliens. Like that and Alice Johnson gearing up in Nightmare 4. And Nightmare 4, just like Halloween 4, is super underrated. Like, dude, someone fights Freddy in a dojo, like a dream dojo with karate, and they win. It's amazing. So yeah, so I would say in terms of like neglected final girls, I got to give that for Danielle Harris and Lisa Wilcox. Oh, and I'll also say, I think for everyone on earth, maybe that's exaggerating slightly, but Caroline Williams stretch in uh, Texas Chainsaw 2 is like she's like the big sister you wanted like she's the big sister final girl it's i don't know i i, I don't know anyone who's seen how um uh, texas chainsaw massacre 2 who's not a stretch fan um i am still my mind is still running on this idea of a made for tv uh, movie streaming channel like i i'm a I little bit obsessed with hard movie. i don't think it would be hard I, f I feel like, I mean, come on. It, it, can't, it really cannot be that hard. Um, but <laughs> I mean, listen, the licensing deals would be so easy. None of these networks are licensing or streaming their, um, their made-for-TV stuff. Like no. maybe one or two here and there. If, if you could, yeah, it would really just be a matter of finding the ones that are just floating around on VHS that, you know, nobody, I don't know anybody who owns the VHS player. But, but you know, don't you also want to do things like mini series Monday when it's like Herman Wokes, Wind of War, all 18 hours, just marathon, you know? Um, yes. <laughs> or, yeah, or America, which was a 16 hour mini series about the Soviet Union taking over America and like machine gunning Congress. 16 hours. It's insane. I mean, oh, I want this stuff so bad. We, we used to do that. I mean, like, we, we, I'm speaking like I made the movies, but miniseries were like that, though. Oh, yeah. Like, when they I was little, so long. yeah, you, you'd watch them for, like, two weeks. And it's oh, insane yeah. to think about just the fact that somebody had to, like, write that and film that. I mean. Well, they sort of move with soap opera pacing, right? Like, yeah. Like, every scene barely moves to another scene. Okay, so I just looked it up. Mini series sorted by longest, which you know, War and Remembrance, Herman Wilkes War and Remembrance, thirty hours. Holy oh hell, thirty hours! <laughs> Good God, insane. Uh, 
I'm yeah. wondering if because we have record stores now, if we're gonna if we'll have a store someday, Lisa, where you can go buy some VHS tapes at a VCR. <laughs> go back I, to that media. Uh, honestly, nothing would make me happier. <laughs> <laughs> nothing would make me happier. Um, oh my god. Okay, this is we're we're going to be switching from this because I I could be talking about this forever, but I know. that's not what we're here to talk about. Um, so Wait, you mentioned you saw uh, thirteen women. Yes. Okay. Okay. So yeah. first off, just for your listeners, thirteen women is this sort of weird pre code nineteen thirty two movie that's kind of I think a proto slasher like I don't think it had an influence on it because no one remembers it but it is crazy to watch it with a slasher point of view Lisa you saw it what do you think yeah I mean I think it's 100% a proto slasher number one it makes me realize not realize but remember how much I love these kind of pre-code movies um I know oh like they you could just tell that they were doing I don't know there was this I was thinking this while I was watching the movie is that they have this feel of, they were just trying, they were experimenting with each film, you know, it was like, yeah. they had this, I mean, it wasn't exactly, movies weren't exactly new, but they kind of were, um, you know, this like new medium. And it was like, Oh, what can we do with this? Which is amazing. And Oh, there was so So, okay. Just to kind of back up a little bit, the conversation with 13 women kind of started because we had been talking about what might be the first proto slasher. And I think Mel had come up with the idea of the spiral staircase, which was in 46, which fits. I mean, because yeah. you've got, yeah, the serial killings of the women and you get a bit of the um, point of view of the killer and a woman having to kill the, um, you know, kill the killer to kind of escape. So that, I mean, that fits. I like the spiral staircase, but this movie, <laughs> first of all, I am obsessed with Myrna Loy in this film. I want to learn how to stare the way she stares. I had just, I don't know. I've never seen anything like it, but for our listeners who have not seen it, basically there is 12 women who, what are they? They're connected through a kind of, through a, like an all girls oh, no, Yeah, 12 women. Yeah. Yeah. They, 12 no, they women because they're so thin. They were all in the same sorority. Right, right. Um, and they have, they all go to see, what is he described as in the movie? A Swami, right? Yeah, he, Swami Yogadachi. <laughs> right. And uh, he gives them their horoscopes, which, you know, again, coming, coming from a conservative background, I knew right away, I was like, oh, no. You're not supposed to be messing with horoscopes. <laughs> this is going to be your downfall, which it was. But yes, their horoscopes were amazing. And they all basically like said, like, this is the way you're going to die. Oh, my God. They're so good. They're like, I I, I, I love Swami Yogadachi's notes to the women. It's like, <laughs> you will drive nails into your own eyes before June <laughs> in a screaming orgy of bloodshed. I wish it was otherwise, but the relation of Virgo to your sun sign is irrefutable. With deepest <laughs> apologies, Swami Yoga. Like, he's so apologetic, but he's so graphic and insane. Oh. He is. He is. And I loved the way this movie built tension, too, because the women would read their their prediction, and it would be like, you know, this is going to happen before July 1st or whatever. Then the, the like, sh next shot would be a calendar you know, pages being ripped away and you're like, oh, okay, here it is. We're about to see it. <laughs> um, so that was really neat. I, I loved how you kind of had a little bit of the hysterical woman trope. I can't remember her name now. It, it was one of the women who had learned she was going to die horribly and was flipping out about it. And then at the same time, she learned that the Swami had said he was going to die. Yeah. And her friend was trying to be like the rational person to like talking her down. Like there is no way that this guy is going to kill himself to prove a point basically. And she's like, yes, but if he does kill himself, then I'll know it's all true. And of course he does die. Um, yeah. And that sends everything into tailspin. But I just, I loved the way, I don't know the different way the women reacted to the news of their impending like horrible gory death 
I, I don't know. I just found that really enjoying. And then, of course, the thing we're not talking about is that the 13th woman is really behind it all, that she's using the Swami's, I guess, his name to convince these women of how they're going to die. Yeah, that was a little, that was, that was, that was hard to figure out. Oh, yeah, were they trying to, I mean, was it like power of suggestion? I don't know. I mean, it was just like, she was just using him as a rube. I'm not, I'm not exactly sure. I got the impression she was supposed to have some sort of supernatural power because she was not fully white. Because that's why they treat her so horribly. Yeah, Yeah, they're, they're, yeah, I guess she was supposed to have like some sort of, that was the stare, right? Was she could like hypnotize the Swami and put, I forgot about that. She did, she did put him to sleep at one point. Um, yeah. by staring that seemed at to be him. Do, just put people to sleep. But, you know, it worked. <laughs> he fell in front of the train, so. This is true. But I love that this, I mean, this to me fits, if we're calling, like, final girls, slashers, like, murder, if we're looping it under the umbrella of murder movie, I think this fits as, like, one of the first real kind of serial killer murder movies. And I love that a woman is the villain behind it. I just. I yeah. And I also, so two things that I think are really kind of amazing in this one is one is, uh, so the woman who kills her husband with the knife, right. In it, you know, she yeah. goes crazy. And kills, yeah. yeah. That's Peg and whistle. This is her one. Peg and whistle is famously <gasps> the actress who jumped From off the Hollywood, Hollywood side and killed herself. Oh, and yeah. I did not she, make that connection. And she killed herself one month before this movie came out. She killed herself in September, and this movie came out in mid-October, 1932. So, like, it's the one role she had in her life. And a lot of people feel like she killed herself because her career was unsuccessful. So, shout out to Peg. The other thing is, and I don't want to spoil anything, because this movie's available on Amazon Prime, and it's like 70 minutes long. But A, I love that the killer draws a big X through each woman's face, at, or like, after they die. Like, I just, I'm a big fan of, like, keeping score like that. But also, I actually, there's a lot of super dubious racial stuff in this movie. But ultimately, I actually think it winds up falling on the right side of that fence. Because the reason Myrna Loy, or the reason Ursula Georgie, who's painted by a white actor and sort of like weird Asian yellow face, is, is killing people is because of racism. Because everyone found out that she was half Asian or half South Asian and was horrible to her and awful to her. And she's like, screw you, whitey. So there's this kind of like, I mean, for all the dubious racial baggage this movie has, it actually has kind of an interesting read on it. Yeah. And she, in her bad, uh, bad person speech, uh, I, I won't give spoilers, but you know, that you got to have one. She explains that in yeah. really specific detail. They don't shy away from that, that it was racism mm-hmm. that she's yeah. responding to. Yeah. Yeah, and and that because she's half, half you know half South Asian, that everyone felt like she wasn't human, and like ah, oh, it's so. I mean, it's it's really. I think it's really great. I you know it's funny. One of the reasons I probably go on about that too much is one of the things I've noticed in a lot of serial killer fiction, a lot of serial killer, less the movies, more the books, but in a lot of slashers too. A, there's not a lot of representation of, like, non-white people. But B, oh, my God, they are so transphobic, like, in such a crazy way. And, like, it's, like, baked into the genre. And so whenever I see someone giving even the slightest nod to some kind of, like, you know, institutional racism and its sins or any kind of institutional oppression and its sins, I'm like, yes, thank God. Yeah, I I, I think... I, I pick, yeah, yeah, I completely agree with that. And that was one thing uh, we're, we're, we won't go into it too much. I think that we've talked about in the past about uh, Carol Clover's book is just sometimes it's like, it feels a bit pres- prescriptive maybe with gender because she, she does talk a little bit about how in these kind of slasher films, the, the killer is a killer because he's not like 100% fits the role of masculine and 
the final girl kind of stands out from her peers because she's not like the other girls. Like Mm -hmm. she's not entirely feminine, you know, Oh, she's the one who notices things and she's smart. And there, again, I don't want to say anything. I don't want to make it sound like we don't like Clover's book because we do. And it was very important (laughs) Um, and kind of like kicking off this um, film theory, especially with the slasher genre. But I think that's one thing that sometimes if you have a pitfall with these films, that tends to be where it is. And I'd love to see that at least if 13 women is the start, if we're going to kind of pinpoint that, then Mm -hmm. it was already pushing back on that. If that makes sense. Yeah. And you know, it's interesting because, you know, it's also Clover's book is what? 92, 93, somewhere Uh, in there. Yeah. 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 Yeah, it's like the early, maybe mid-90s, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, that was the understanding of gender at the time. I mean, you had had academics certainly talking about gender in much more interesting ways, and and they had been for a while. But in terms of mainstream discourse, I mean, that was the course, that was the the conversation about gender, male, female, or you existed in some kind of liminal space in between that made you very suspect. Yeah. Yeah, that's that. Yeah, because that's that's kind of what she was talking about with the. I mean, that's what she builds her final girl theory on, and that's why, like, the final girl, you know, is presented as kind of virginal because she's almost she almost fits this like asexual. She's got you know brunette hair. She's got a boy's name. Boy's name, yeah, Lori Ripley. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, it's really interesting. Yeah, well, and you know, it's one of those interesting things that I keep trying to, and that's one of the things I'm trying to do is like, where'd that come from? Like, the furthest back I can pinpoint it is Psycho, but I know there's got to be something earlier than that, you know, like where that notion of these killers being somehow neither male nor female, and that was part of their problem, where, where, where did that come? I mean, and Psycho really does like put that front and center and it was a huge hit. So it's hard to argue that that might have been it. But I, I just keep trying to find something earlier because it's so all pervasive throughout this genre. Mm. Um, just, well, Clover, yeah. Clover names Psycho as her kind of prototype for that. Um, yeah, I mean, huh. I think you could look see- earlier, though. Well, that's what I've been trying to do. And at the same time, it's like, you know, there's so many, there's so many of these books out there. You know what I mean? Like Jim Thompson, certainly before Psycho was writing killer narrated books in like 52 and uh, with the killer inside me, but he's, he's only got one man who wears women's clothing as a killer in one of his books who like castrates himself at the same time on like a broken window uh but that's not a book about a serial killer you know so i i just keep i don't know i there, there's this thing's gotta pop up somewhere earlier so i'm digging well okay i i'm i mel and matt know that i always bring up this movie so i'm gonna bring it up again <laughs> because i want it to fit in somewhere It's not a, I don't think, kind of the masculine, feminine, like gray area in the same sort of way, but I think it fits with the killer not being a kind of, quote unquote, fully functioning man. Um, And that's uh, House of Wax with Vincent Price. Oh, sure. Yeah. Just because, you know, being like wheelchair bound and the whole idea of the artist who lost his ability to work um, because his hands are, I don't know. I think like that sort of fits. But also though that, I mean, I think that idea of the killer somehow being impotent, you know, like, isn't it bucket of blood with Dick Smith where like he, he can't, he can't uh, sculpt, he can't do his art. And then, like, he uh, starts to kill people and, like, sculpt their corpses and, like, becomes popular. So it's like, you know, he's got this sort of symbolic impotence, like he can't do his art. And then he has to kill people to get it back. You even look at, like, 13 women. The killer is a woman and a man, you know, and she's sort of controlling the dude. I mean, the killers always seem to exist in this weird space. But I definitely think the idea of the killer being impotent somehow, you know, and the the killings we come back, that that goes back a long way. Yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely. The kind of you can't fit in with the with the rest. Now, I, I, Bucket of Blood, that's the one where he has like his sculpture with the cat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I spent a minute. Okay. Yeah. And, you know, you also get back to there's this interesting thing with um, – like in a lonely place by Dorothy. He was not the movie with Humphrey Bogart, which is fine, but it has nothing to do with the book. But you know, you have this thing too where he's a war veteran, and there's another serial killer book around the same time. Oh God, I'm I'm losing the title. But where the guy's a war veteran, and you're like, oh, this is really interesting. Actually, you know, this idea of like, you know, it's sort of like um, what's the Hemingway book? Uh, for whom the bell tolls is it for whom the bell tolls where it's sort of like understood that the hero's like impotent because he got his like nut shot off, shot off in the war. Um, but there is that kind of element to some of these books where you think that maybe there was some kind of unmanly, unmanning injury in the war haunting them, making them kill people, women mostly. Hmm. The idea of impotence seems to come up again. And then the idea of the bad mother constantly, the bad mother oh, who turns God, her son. <laughs> into a killer um it's oh, always something. moms <laughs> but you know um, but that was really in the child rearing stuff of the day i mean that whole idea of suffocating mothers who were turning out a generation of sissies in the like mm -hmm. 40s and 50s that was a big like weird bugbear people had yeah and it crossed over into kind of real life like people who were studying serial killers later when serial killer actually became like a term, that was one of the first things psychologists tried to put it on was the idea of, Oh, what was his relationship with his mother? Like, um, yeah. Yeah. Well, I, yeah, I love all that stuff too. All of that, like early FBI profiling and stuff. It's so ridiculous. I mean, they're like, the killer is someone who has an unhealthy relationship to women. You think? Like, <laughs> he views himself as powerless and the way he gets power is by killing women how did i can only think of two people in america that applies to let's go arrest them like that early profiling it was so hyped up and it's yeah, so yeah. ridiculous when you read it it's like bizarre yeah he must have been rejected by a brunette woman that's why he kills <laughs> brunettes yeah exactly um, I was just going to say, you know, one of the things that's interesting is when you look back at the profiler, who's such a huge part of serial killer fiction now, you know, um, and, and the movies, is the historical analog to the profiler, someone who comes into a town and they look at signs and symbols of something that's happened, some crime. And from that crime, they reconstruct the identity of a hidden killer who has been plaguing this community. That's a witch hunter. That's a, that's cotton. That's a dude oh, who yeah. rides into a town and says, these women are witches. Let's hang them by the neck until they're dead. Here's the magic evidence. Only I had the skill to unearth. So, like, I love that profiler stuff because it's so toxic and so it's so heroic. Here, uh, um, eulogized, you know, is this amazing thing. I I had never made the connection to Cotton Mather before, and I think now I will never be able to <laughs> unsee Cotton that. Mather. Like, yeah, <laughs> profiler <laughs> or Matthew Hopkins in England. He was exactly. the guy who just traveled around and got paid. He's like, oh, these ten women are witches. Give me my money, and then moved to another town and did the same thing. Yeah, CSI Salem. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Okay, well, on that note, <laughs> I think that's a good place. Thank you so much, Grady. Oh, dude, it is so much fun to talk to y'all. It's always a blast. Thank oh, yeah. y'all. Okay, I've, I've been looking forward to this. Well, I, on behalf of myself, Matt and Mel, I'd like to thank Grady Hendricks for that wonderful, wonderful deep dive into the final girl. As always, I enjoyed it. If you'd like to follow Grady's work, he is on social media. His Twitter is at Grady underscore Hendrix. He also has a website, uh, www.gradyhendrix.com. I think if you go to his website, you can find a newsletter sign up. I highly recommend it because it, it is always fun and informative. And if you want to follow us, we're at no Fear Cast on Twitter and Instagram. And we also have a Facebook page. Our email is nofearcast at gmail.com. 
if you love what we're doing, consider supporting us on Patreon and get access to exclusive content or simply rate and review us, which is entirely free for you and helps other listeners find us. The music by Nicholas Gasparini. Thanks for listening. We'll be back in two weeks with a brand new episode.